welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, September 7th, we discuss hijabs, dreads, and Saturdays off, employees' religious rights in the workplace. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call. This afternoon, we are joined by Rachel Morrison. Rachel is a policy analyst at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. She is formerly an attorney advisor at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and she has also worked at Americans United for Life and the Beckett Fund as a constitutional law fellow. Rachel graduated from Pepperdine University School of Law, and she clerked for Judge Victor Uwolski on the United States Court of Federal Claims. We're very pleased to welcome Rachel this afternoon. I'm looking forward to this afternoon's discussion. We will be taking audience questions towards the end of today's program, so please enter your questions into the Q&A feature of your Zoom screen, and uh, Rachel will handle those questions towards the end, time permitting. Please feel free to enter questions into the Q&A tab at any time. With that, thank you for being with us today. Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you to FedSoc for hosting this webinar. I think it's important to talk about employees' religious rights in the workplace. Uh, many employees employees don't know their rights or they think that they don't have an option to be religious in the workplace. So the goal of uh, the webinar today is to educate you about um, employees' rights to religious expression, non-discrimination, and accommodation in the workplace. I will address each of those in turn. Uh, these issues are very fact-specific, um, so my goal is to address the legal framework on how to analyze these issues and not get into the nuances of any one specific scenario and how it should come out under the law. Uh, so to set the stage, uh, I want to clarify that I'm talking about the rights of employees who work for secular organizations or for federal or state governments. Um, there's additional considerations for employees who work for religious organizations. Religious organizations have uh, certain rights to employ individuals uh, that share their religion or to make employment decisions based on religion. Uh, if you want to know more about that, there's going to be another webinar in this series. So stay tuned for that. Um, so I will be focusing on employees uh, who do not work for religious organizations. So to start off, let's talk about religious expression. Um, first thing we should probably do is define what is religious. Uh, if you've ever had to define religion, you know that it's, it's hard to define what religion is. Uh, so I'll share with you uh, what the courts have said about what is considered religious under the law. Um, so a belief is considered religious if it's uh, religious in the person's own scheme of things, um, if it's a sincere and meaningful belief that occupies in the life of the possessor a place parallel to that filled by God. Uh, this includes theistic beliefs as well as non-theistic moral or ethical beliefs as to what is right and wrong uh, that are sincerely held with the same strength as traditional religious views. Uh, typically, beliefs must concern ultimate ideas about life, purpose, and death. And so religion includes traditional organized religions, including uh, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, Sikhism, uh, and the like, but it also includes religious beliefs that are new or uncommon, that are not part of a formal church or sect, or only subscribed to by a small group. Uh, they can seem illogical or unreasonable to others, um, including to the employer. So Title VII defines religion to include all aspects of religious observance in practice as well as beliefs. So this is a very broad definition of religion. Um, and so legal protections uh, for employment discrimination extend to more than just practices that are mandated or prohibited by a tenet of an individual's faith. Um, it's also important to note that uh, uh, something that is religious under Title VII uh, is considered religious even if the, uh, the organized religion that the employee is affiliated with does not espouse that belief or has a different one. Uh, it's focused on what the individual's religious beliefs are. So to put this in context, uh, you might have seen there's some controversy over uh, President Biden claiming to be Catholic and whether his views on abortion align with the Catholic faith. Uh, while that's an interesting theological question, uh, for purposes of the law, uh, Biden would be able to have the views he wants on abortion regardless of what the Catholic Church says. Um, another issue that I've seen recently also involving uh, Catholic Church is the view of um, whether 
it is morally permissible or required to take a COVID-19 vaccine or whether you can have a religious objection to that. Uh, for employers, uh, it matters what the individual uh, employee's religious beliefs are, not what the Catholic Church itself has espoused. Um, and so when you're dealing with religious discrimination, uh, courts and employers should look at whether the beliefs are religious and whether they are sincerely held. So a belief is not religious if it is merely philosophical or personal, uh, if it's political or social. Uh, so think about a situation where two different employees can have the same practice for different reasons. So say an employee is uh, vegetarian for religious reasons, uh, certain dietary uh, prescriptions according to their religious beliefs. Um, but say you can also have an employee who is vegetarian uh, for environmental reasons, for animal rights reasons, for other reasons. Um, so only the first employee's practices would be protected um, as religious under the law. Uh, it's also important to note that um, for re religious uh, employees, it's important to not claim that certain practices are religious uh, if they're not done for religious reasons. And so it's so the practices need to be religious, um, but they also need to be sincerely held. Uh, generally, this is assumed by employers and by the courts, uh, unless there's reasons to suspect pretext. Um, for example, say you uh, an employee asks for time off for a concert on Saturday, and that gets denied. The employee comes back and then asks for uh, time off on Saturday to observe the Sabbath. Now, this might give, give an indication that it's being asked um, pretextually that there's not a sincerely held religious belief to observe the Sabbath on Saturday. Uh, that being said, it's also important to recognize that beliefs can change over time, um, that employees may not perfectly follow all of their religious tenets, um, and that the employees' beliefs can be different than the organized religion's practice. Um, so what does religious expression look like in the workplace? Religious expression is an outward reflection of your religious beliefs or faiths, it's uh, affirmatively doing something or choosing to refrain from doing something. When I was at the EEOC, I looked at hundreds of charges of religious discrimination uh, and my colleagues and I on the General Counsel's Religious Discrimination Work Group decided that it uh, made sense to group these different types of claims into four broad categories. Uh, it just helped us conceptually uh, organize these claims in our mind and think about these claims. Um, I'll share those with you. Uh, these are not legal categories and they're not perfect categories. Some types of religious discrimination claims can fall into multiple categories depending on how you frame them. Um, so the four categories are, um, the first one's appearance. Uh, this includes clothing or grooming. So think about clothing in the sense of uh, wearing a hijab or a turban wearing uh, modest clothing, such as wearing uh, skirts or dresses instead of pants, uh, grooming, uh, these are issues related to hair, and whether you want to cut your hair or if you have uh, dreadlocks, such as for Rastafarians. Uh, this also is beards, uh, and whether you have to have um, a beard for religious reasons. Uh, this could also include things such as jewelry, uh, wearing a cross necklace, or perhaps a religious tattoo. And so that's the first category. The second category is observance. So think about observance in the sense of uh, taking prayer breaks during the day or observing the Sabbath, whether that's Friday or Saturday or Sunday. This could be attending a religious service or convention. Uh, this could be ritual type practices, it could be uh, the types of food you eat or drink, uh, whether you're kosher or halal, whether you don't drink alcohol or whether you don't drink caffeine, or whether you need to take time off to go on a pilgrimage. So we have appearance, observance, and the third one is expression. Obviously, all of these are religious expression on some level, but for this category, think about expression in the sense of free speech context. So these are sayings that you say, such as having a blessed day or maybe having, having a byline after your signature on an email with a religious quote or verse. Uh, so this could be having a religious text at your workplace or a poster or 
um, a verse or passage. It could be listening to Christian music. It could be uh, proselytizing or talking about your faith or your religion with others. Um, so we have appearance, observance, expression, and the final category is forced participation. So this is the desire to refrain from doing something for religious reasons. Uh, this could be choosing not to participate in a holiday party or a celebration of something, uh, some social or political or other type of event uh, that goes on at work. Uh, it could be trying to promote values that are contrary to your faith. Uh, this could be uh, something such as taking a flu vaccination um, or these days the COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, it could be swearing an oath. Uh, for healthcare workers, it could be participating in an abortion procedure or sterilization or uh, transgender surgeries. Um, for pharmacists, it could be dispensing contraception in general or certain types of contraception that uh, are considered potential abortifacients. Um, for truck drivers, it could be transporting alcohol. Uh, if your employer has optional religious activity or starts off a meeting with a prayer or invocation, uh, you could choose not to participate in that as, um, as uh, for your for religious reasons. Um, so these are the various ways that religious expression can come up in the workplace, and I'm sure you can probably think of other ways as well. Uh, so under the law, uh, you are protected from uh, religious uh, non uh, from religious discrimination on the basis of religion. Uh, the main law that applies to that is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This applies to employers who have 15 or more employees, um, and it prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion as well as race, color, sex, and national origin. Uh, so you're protected from discrimination in hiring, firing, promotions, training, wages, terms, conditions, benefits, privileges. Uh, basically, an employer cannot make a decision for religious reasons, whether that's because you are of a certain religion or because you are not of a certain religion. Um, it's important to note that in this, in this way, uh, atheists, agnostics, non-religious are also protected from religious discrimination. They cannot be uh, they cannot be fired because they are not uh, Christian or Jewish or Muslim. Um, and you cannot hire someone because they are Christian or Jewish or Muslim um, as a secular organization. Um, employers cannot uh, make the decision because of religion or because someone is not of a religion. Um, if an employer allows something for secular reasons, they also have to allow it for religious reasons. Um, so say, for example, that an employer allows the use of uh, break rooms before or after work or during lunch uh, to be reserved for use to watch uh, football games or to uh, meet with other colleagues to discuss a book. Uh, they would also need to allow the use of the break rooms for a Bible study or for prayer meetings as well uh, during the non-work uh, non -work hours. So Title VII protects from disparate treatment in uh, the work environment, um, and it also protects against hostile work environments. So hostile work environments is uh, illegal harassment. Uh, so religious harassment's analyzed and proved in the same manner as harassment uh, based on other traits, but there's potentially unique considerations in the religious context, uh, especially when the alleged harassment relates to another employee's uh, religious practices. Harassment itself can be uh, physical or verbal, um, and it has to be, in order to be religious harassment, it has to be based on the person's religion or lack of a certain religion. So illegal, illegal harassment occurs when comments or conduct are unwelcome um, and when they become severe or pervasive uh, so that they create a hostile work environment. So unwelcome is the person uh, that is being harassed does not uh, want to engage in the conduct or hear the comments or talk about the comments. Um, and so uh, usually the person needs to indicate that it is unwelcome. Uh, sometimes something such as a racial slur or uh, physical harassment can is more likely to be assumed that it is unwelcome. Um, so it either needs to be severe or pervasive, and this is a sliding scale. The more severe something is, the less pervasive it needs to be. 
uh, the less severe something is, the more pervasive or uh, multiple occurrences that need to happen in order for it to become um, an illegal hostile work environment. It's important to note that Title VII is not a general civility code. Uh, it doesn't render any insensitive or offensive comment, uh, any petty slight or annoyance illegal. Um, it, harassment doesn't occur just because someone mentions their faith in the workplace. Uh, proselytizing itself is not per se harassment. However, if a colleague that you're talking to uh, asks you not to talk about your religion, if you keep talking about your religion, that could move into the realm of harassment. Um, it's also important to note that there's a special concerns uh, for supervisors or managers. Uh, if you're inviting or encouraging others to participate in um, a religious exercise, uh, such as a prayer meeting or to study a religious book or scripture, or uh, having conversations about religion, uh, it's important for supervisors and managers to make sure that it is clear that it's optional, that employment decisions won't be based on the other employees' uh, acceptance or rejection of the religion and that um, there's no coercion in, in that interaction at all. So Title VII also protects against retaliation. It prohibits an employer from retaliating against an employee who um, complains about uh, religious discrimination or who files a charge of religious discrimination or uh, whether that's for themselves or for um, another colleague. Um, and so an employer cannot uh, treat you um, treat you poorly, uh, adverse employment action, not, uh, not promote you, not fire you, uh, not give you uh, certain benefits because you brought up the issue of uh, religious harassment or discrimination or accommodation. Um, and so that leads me to religious accommodation. Uh, Title VII it requires employers to reasonably accommodate an employee's religious beliefs, observances, and practices, unless an accommodation would create an undue hardship on the conduct of the employer's business. Um, so the need for accommodation arises when uh, there's a neutral workplace or job duty that conflicts with the religious belief, observance, or practice. Uh, so to provide some examples, uh, while I was at the EOC, I looked at a number of religious discrimination cases that EOC uh, had brought. Um, the majority of these cases uh, fell into th three of the categories. The first one was appearance. Uh, so this was clothing and grooming issues brought on behalf of Muslims, uh, Pentecostals, and Rastafarians. Um, the other cases fell under observance, which were Sabbath observance, uh, holy days or prayer breaks brought on behalf of Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jews, and Muslims. And then the third category was forced participation. Uh, this included flu vaccinations, um, and this was all pre-COVID, um, brought mainly on behalf of members of various Christian denominations. And so those were a lot of the cases that EOC itself was bringing against employers. Um, but that's only a subset of all of the religious discrimination charges that have been filed. Uh, many of those cases will settle or individuals will request uh, a notice of right to sue so that they can sue in federal court on those issues themselves. Um, so perhaps the most well-known Title VII religion case is uh, Abercrombie and Fitch stores uh, brought by the EEOC. Uh, this was a case that involved um, the clothing store's refusal to hire a Muslim applicant uh, who wore a hijab to the interview because they assumed correctly that she would need an accommodation from Abercrombie's look policy, which prohibited employees from wearing caps. Uh, the Supreme Court in 2015 found that Abercrombie violated Title VII because an employer may not make an applicant's religious practice, confirmed or otherwise, a factor in employment decisions. The court explained, quote, Title VII does not demand mere neutrality with regard to religious practices, that they be treated no worse than other practices. Rather, it gives them favored treatment, affirmatively obligating employers not to fail to refuse to hire or discharge any individual because of such individual's religious observance or practice, end quote. So in other words, the Supreme Court held that the law requires employers to actively accommodate the religious practices and conduct of employees. 
uh, going so far as to call it favored treatment. So Title VII requires religious accommodations if they are reasonable and if they do not pose an undue hardship. So what is a reasonable accommodation? Uh, first off, uh, an employee who needs an accommodation should inform their employer of the need for an accommodation. Uh, it's important to explain the nature of the conduct and propose a potential um, accommodation. However, the accommodation that the employer gives does not need to be the employee's preferred accommodation. It just needs to be reasonable. Um, an accommodation is reasonable if it eliminates the conflict and um, if it doesn't change the employee's terms and conditions, um, unless there's no other options. So a partial, a partial elimination um, of the conflict uh, is generally not considered reasonable. So say you have um, your Sabbath observance is uh, Friday night at sundown through, uh, through Saturday, um, and you request for time off to observe the Sabbath. The employer said, oh, you can work Friday nights, but you can have Saturdays off, we'll give you that. Um, that would not be considered a reasonable accommodation unless there was no other way to give the employee Friday nights off. Um, a related issue is transferring an employee to a different position is generally not seen as reasonable unless there is no way to accommodate the employee in the particular position that they hold. Um, so reasonable is a very fact specific of what is reasonable uh, for that employee in that position, to deploy er, that specific employer. So what is an undue hardship? Um, undue hardship is not defined in Title VII. Uh, however, the Supreme Court defined undue hardship in a 1977 case, TWA versus Hardison. They defined undue hardship as more than de minimis cost. I'll let you decide whether you think that's a great definition of undue hardship. Um, it has been uh, perhaps not unsurprisingly criticized by many. Uh, by way of comparison, the Americans with Disability Act, which was passed uh, after the Hardison case, explicitly defines undue hardship as an action requiring significant difficulty or expense. So this has been uh, an ongoing legal issue uh, in the courts. Uh, there's been recent cert petitions the last couple terms raising this issue of whether Hardison's definition of undue hardship is actually the correct definition. Uh, in, a, uh, in a denial of cert, Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch agreed that in an appropriate case, the court should consider whether Hardison should be overruled. Um, recognizing that Hardison's de minimis standard is not the most likely interpretation of undue hardship. So in practice, uh, courts vary as to how, how strictly they read more than de minimis, whether it is minimal or whether it's actually a heightened uh, more than de minimis. Uh, things that are considered uh, hardship are if it's costly to the employer, uh, such as if the employer has to hire an additional employee at a premium wage, uh, whether it creates a security issue or a safety issue, um, such as um, for a woman who wants to wear a dress or skirts, uh, but is working on machinery, it could cause a safety issue if she doesn't wear pants. Um, so in that case, an accommodation would likely be denied um, as an undue hardship. Um, an undue hardship also occurs if it infringes on the rights of um, other employees or if it impacts a sen seniority system that's in place, um, where it whether it would require other employees to take on additional duties or to work uh, on uh, vacation or the like uh, would be considered an undue hardship. Um, so I've talked about uh, religious expression, uh, non-discrimination and accommodation. Uh, and these are issues that apply to both uh, secular organizations and also to uh, federal and state governments. Uh, but in the federal government context um, and also in the state government context, there's additional concerns um, and laws that might apply. Uh, the uh, governments are constrained by the First Amendment, um, the right to free speech, uh, free exercise of religion, the Equal Protection Clause, uh, the clause against no oaths for religious office, um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, um, and federal government cannot disfavor religion. Uh, 
Now you might be wondering, what about the Establishment Clause? Uh, there's been several court cases involving the Establishment Clause. Uh, courts have held that it doesn't violate the Establishment Clause to allow uh, religious expression in the workplace, um, and that it could violate the Free Exercise Clause, at least in the federal government context, uh, to, to limit that expression. Um, there's also additional laws, uh, state laws, non-discrimination laws that uh, protect against religion. There's some state RIFRAs. Um, the federal RIFRA doesn't apply to states. Um, that could also apply in these cases. Um, and then finally, I just want to conclude with uh, what you do if you think you are experiencing religious discrimination uh, in the workplace. Uh, if you think you need an accommodation, but the accommodation is denied. Um, so you can bring a charge uh, of discrimination. Uh, you file a charge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. You have 180 days uh, to do so. Uh, you have to do that first before you go to federal court. Um, so you can't bring a Title VII claim in district court first without going to the EEOC. Um, whereas if you're bringing a First Amendment claim or a RIFRA claim or another claim under the Constitution, you can go to court first without having to go to the EEOC. Um, if you're uh, in the federal government, you have 45 days to contact a counselor at the agency's EEO office. EEO just stands for Equal Employment Opportunity. Um, and there's an internal process for trying to resolve, resolve those issues. Um, I will say for healthcare employees th that uh, there are also protections uh, under federal law, conscience protections that protect your right to not participate in abortions or sterilizations uh, that violate your sincerely held religious beliefs. Um, HHS is uh, in charge of uh, enforcing those laws. And so you can file a complaint with the Office for Civil Rights uh, on those uh, healthcare conscience rights related issues. Uh, I'd encourage you to file both with the Office for Civil Rights and the EEOC, uh, which requires uh, which requires accommodations under Title VII. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to Evelyn. It looks like we have a couple questions in the queue already. Great, yes, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. And we're very great for your time and your comments. Um, let's go to audience questions and as a note to our audience, please do feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll turn now to our first question from Ron Colombo. Um, a bit of a long question. He says, a fair number of employers are announcing religious exemptions to their imposition of COVID-19 vaccine mandates, yet rejecting applications on the grounds that the employees have failed to demonstrate genuine good faith religious opposition to vaccination. They seem to be defining religion very narrowly as perhaps only extending to those employees who have a religious opposition to all vaccinations, not just the COVID-19 vaccine. Assuming that the exemption application was indeed framed in obviously religious terms, how could employers possibly prevail in court if these rejections are challenged in litigation? That's a great question. And that's obviously a question that is uh, very live right now. Uh, it's important for uh, employers to recognize that um, Concerns over COVID-19 don't mean that they can just ignore religion in a way that they wouldn't ignore religion um, in other some circumstances. Uh, so, uh, so the employer doesn't get to define religion for the employee themselves. Um, I think there's issues over uh, like sincerity of whether employees um, are sincere, uh, have a sincere objection to or sincere religious objection to a COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and so asking the employee to um, explain the nature of that uh, is permitted. However, uh, onerous, onerous um, Q and A's or uh, making an employee write a theological treatise to, to justify it uh, is probably um, bordering on potential, um, potential uh, prohibited activity. Um, the it, it's a very yeah it's a very sensitive topic um, so there's so there's a couple issues when an employee asks for accommodation the first is uh, is it uh, religious um, and is it sincerely held um, and usually the employers uh, should assume sincerity unless they don't 
unless there's a reason not to. Uh, there's different types of vaccines and there's different types of objections. So just because an employee objects to a specific um, vaccine doesn't mean they necessarily object to all vaccines. Some employees object to all vaccines. Uh, if the objection is to putting something into their body, that would probably be all vaccines. If it's uh, something such as uh, a vaccine, uh, not the COVID vaccine, but other vaccines are used with certain like animal products, uh, there's objections to that. Um, for COVID-19, the religious obje objections seem to be based on the fact that they were uh, that they were made with uh, fetal cell lines um, or uh, uh, the uh, the vaccine themselves weren't, but the, um, was it the, um, the process of creating the vaccine used um, cell lines from aborted, uh, aborted fetuses. Um, and so uh, that's the, the religious objection to being, uh, being part of that. Um, and so, yeah, so, that, so, that's the, so that's the first part. The second part is, is there a reasonable accommodation? Um, this could be something such as mask wearing um, or physical distancing, working remotely, uh, in the healthcare context, uh, pre-COVID, there was a lot of hospitals that required flu vaccinations from their from their employees. Uh, their uh, EOC actually brought uh, a large number of these cases over. I think it was a five or six year period. I looked at cases that um, EOC had brought that were closed, and I think it was about like eight or nine percent involved flu vaccinations. Um, and so accommodations were generally mask wearing or not interacting with certain types of um, certain types of patients. Um, and so then the third consideration in that case is whether it poses an, an undue hardship. A lot of that will go to, I think, the setup of the business, the interactions the person has, the current science on uh, how much the vaccines actually uh, prohibit uh, transmission compared to, say, mask wearing or uh, transmission um, between vaccinated or unvaccinated. So there's a lot of considerations, um, and it's potentially somewhat business dependent. Uh, but I want to caution that employers um, need to be careful not to be hostile to religion when an employee is bringing their uh, their religious accommodation request. And uh, there's a point where an employer goes too far of trying to tell the employee they don't actually have a religious belief or trying to nitpick every little little part of it without any kind of indication that the employee is uh, bringing the religious accommodation claim like um, pretextually that they don't actually have a sincere religious belief. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's a very live issue. There's a lot of a lot of, uh, I think, concern over that issue and a lot of litigation um, that uh, is either resulting or will result or um, potential um, if, you're, if you're denied a religious accommodation and you're fired and you think it was an incorrect denial, you can file a charge of discrimination with the EOC um, and go through that process. Obviously, that's not as ideal, but um, that's basically where things stand uh, right now. Just to follow up on that, my own my own curiosity, I know that some employers have put in place religious exemptions as the question had indicated, but then they put in place an appeal process. And the appeal process, I mean, I've, I've looked at some of the, um, the hoops that are included in that appeal process, and I'm wondering if that, like the imposition of an appeal process following declining declining a person's application for an exception, if that appeal would be a basis for filing with the EEOC. So the, so I don't think the appeal process itself, um, what's at issue is whether the employer is required to provide the reasonable accommodation without the undue hardship. And if they deny a reasonable accommodation that can be given without an undue hardship that violates Title VII, whether that's an initial denial or whether that's uh, after an appeal process itself. Uh, it's usually good practice for an employee to exhaust kind of the um, administrative remedies in, in or the employer remedies of going through that process itself and not just stopping that process. Uh, you need to go through that process first uh, and make sure you make sure you've exhausted the the potential remedies you have internally and not just assume they're not going to give you an accommodation file a claim. You have to actually ask for the accommodation. You have to be denied the accommodation. Uh, you have to provide um, provide you know, an explanation of what the objection is. You can't just say, I have a religious belief. And then, uh, so, so there's, there's a process to go through. 
Um, another note on that uh, I think is important to mention, um, I know a number of employers are asking for uh, religious leaders to provide uh, documentation. Um, you don't have to have a religious leader sign off on your religious practice. Obviously, if a religious leader um, knows about it, it's fine, but that's not a requirement under the law to have a religious um, to have a religious uh, belief or practice that is entitled to protection itself. Great, thank you. All right, our next question um, to change change course a little bit. Do employers have to accommodate religious views that disfavor LGBT individuals? So I think this gets to the, the what I would say, like discrimination versus religious belief. Yes, that's a great question. I. I think I forgot to, I, I was gonna mention something about that and uh, I forgot to mention it. Um, so this often comes up, accommodation type issues come up, I, especially in the uh, school context, uh, right now in the courts involving uh, like preferred names or pronouns uh, for transgender students. And so the, so whether there's an accommodation of teachers being able to use a reasonable accommodation that can be, uh, can be um, there without an undue hardship is kind of, is a live issue in the courts of whether there's an alternative to that, uh, such as using last names or um, the like. Obviously, repeatedly, um, yeah. So there's that. So there's that balance of whether there's an accommodation. Um, an undue hardship uh, would would exist to an accommodation if. Uh, if it is considered harassment. So if your accommodation is you're calling um, an LGBT um, colleague or client or student, whoever, um, like uh, slurs, you know, and you're like, my religion is that, you know, this is, this is uh, what these people are. Like that would be considered uh, an undue hardship to allow an accommodation to allow you to harass someone else. Um, what is considered harassment? Um, Obviously, slurs are on one end, but is using um, a preferred pronoun or uh, pronouns that um, correspond to biology is not something that's settled in the courts of whether that's uh, per se harassment or not, or whether there's alternatives to to that. Um, I think it's important to recognize, uh, just as a general matter, that uh, Title VII itself protects against religious discrimination. It also protects against sex discrimination. Um, after Bostock, sex includes uh, homosexuality and transgender status. And so um, I think there's a lot of ways for for there to um, potentially be conflicts between the two, but there's also a lot of ways where you can work alongside individuals that have different religious beliefs, different beliefs about uh, sexuality um, and gender and marriage, um, and just uh, work, working together and just like recognizing that others might not share the belief, but not, not um, doing in such a way that's harassment. Um, be able to be professional. And so I think there's there's protections for both under the law um, and exactly kind of where all those lines are, uh, I think are, are being litigated in the court. Um, the uh, As far as in the religious employer context, that's not something I'm gonna get into uh, for this talk. There'll be a future webinar again uh, to promote the future webinar on religious employers um, and kind of their rights uh, and whether that means they can fire uh, individuals potentially who have different uh, religious views of same-sex marriage. And um, that's a very live issue in the courts as well. Great, thank you. I will now turn to the next question from Rob Driscoll. I think that you answered this mostly, but in case you wanted to add anything else to your answer, um, what latitude does the EEOC give to employers to impose conditions while granting an accommodation? So I think that was the undue hardship that you had mentioned. So for example, an employer that grants an exemption to a vaccine requirement, but then requires the employee to wear a mask to wash their hands more frequently or moves the individual to a less crowded area of the facility. So I think that goes back to whether the accommodation uh, is reasonable. Um, if your if if these are reasonable ways to allevi alleviate the um, concern of spread of COVID, um, then that would probably be granted. Uh, you could see 
maybe certain instances where um, if you have to, you know, take a COVID test every every hour, like that's probably not a reasonable accommodation at that point, um, like as an extreme. Um, and so it, it depends, I think, on the type of work, the employer's business, what the concerns are itself. Um, if the accommodations are imposed just to be vindictive and, and to, uh, to be vindictive to employees who don't want to receive a vaccine, um, and there's not actually, it, it's, not, it's not reasonable to alleviate whatever the, uh, the concern is, um, then that's potential uh, like harassment or discrimination on the employer's part. Um, but again, kind of where that line is will be very fact dependent and something that I think is being worked out um, or will be worked out um, in the coming year or years on this issue. Great, thank you. Now, another question from Carl Olson. He asks, what about religious use of Schedule 1 hallucinog hallucinogens, uh, peyote and huasca, for example? There's no federal statutory right. Peyote, for example, is exempt by federal regulation. And huasca, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce that, was um, found protected by RIFRA in 2006 by the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes, so the obviously the Employment Division versus Smith involved uh, peyote, um, the, uh, if, if something is illegal under federal law and, uh, an employer, um, uh, like, uh, private employer does not have to provide an accommodation because that would be considered an undue hardship to allow, and to allow a violation of federal law. Um, now when it comes to the, when it comes to the federal government, there's, obviously the First Amendment, depending on what happens with Employment Division versus Smith, um, that might impact this. Uh, obviously, RIFRA exists and RIFRA provides additional protections. And so um, it's not surprising that RIFRA could apply um, apply to um, to drugs in that case. I will say there's a, there's a fun case out of the uh, it was the, the 10th circuit involving drug drug smugglers who claimed to be part of the church of the cognizance. And this is why they needed to, uh, to smuggle drugs. Um, and the court found that this was uh, pretextual. They didn't actually have religious beliefs. And so um, their, their uh, RIFRA claim failed um, because it wasn't actually, actually religious. Thank you. I now I think we're back to the vaccine question. Um, in the vaccine context, how does Title VII apply towards a state mandate like in, like in New York, where an employer might want to grant a religious exemption to the vaccine mandate, but the state is preventing them? So in that in that case, um, the employer would not be required to provide an accommodation if state law prohibits it. I believe. Um, there might be something else at issue that I'm not thinking of right now, but basically if something's illegal, it's an undue hardship for an employer to, to require it. Um, the, if, if it's a religious organization, there might be rights of the religious organization to conduct their, um, to connect their organization or church or whatever it is um, in a religious way that maybe conflicts with or by providing religious accommodations. But um, I'm not sure if I can think of anything off the top of my head for secular employers in that context. What if it were the other way? Because I'm, I'm wondering maybe that, if that was what the, the questioner was getting to, if the state is requiring businesses to implement a vaccine mandate and the employer would like to not comply. I, I think that's the, yeah. the opposite configuration. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the New York uh, mandate is specifically. Um, but I think that if there's a law that requires something, I'm not, there'd have to be some kind of uh, legal right the employer has to not accommodate with something. Um, there'd possibly be uh, a RIFRA claim that an employer could bring or an employee could bring that it substantially burdens their um, religion to have to, to require it. In that case, they'd be, um, the state action would be the state law. Um, and then if the employer wanted to give it, but I think the employee would have to bring the claim in court um, if the employer itself did not have a religious, um, a religious objection. Great, thank you. Uh, 
Let's move to this question. Um, can you rank, I know you had discussed the, the division of the types of claims that you had come up with internally while you were in the EEOC, appearance, observance, expression, and forced participation. Um, could you rank the claims in order of likelihood to succeed? I'm not sure if there's a likelihood to succeed because again, these, these uh, cases are very fact dependent. Um, something I think such as uh, like religious garb is often more likely to succeed because there's gonna be less likely, uh, less likely an undue hardship opposed from maybe a safety issue. Uh, courts have found that like a uniform dress policy such as like no caps for the Abercrombie case like was not sufficient to um, not hire a Muslim uh, who wanted to wear a hijab. Um, so anything that doesn't require doesn't really require much effort on the employer's part is more likely to succeed. Um, there's a lot of issues related to, I think, Sabbath observance um, and kind of depending on how, how much effort the employer has to go to to rearrange schedules or whether um, there's other employees that will volunteer to take, to take those shifts. Um, and again, that kind of goes back to like, what is the undue hardship? Is it just more than de minimis cost and how much effort is that? Um, so depending on the type of work that could, that could um, be more difficult, uh, anytime it involves a kind of a, an interaction between an employee and other employees, that's going to be more difficult. Uh, if it's, I would prefer not to go to this holiday party, that's easy to accommodate. Um, so it, it, uh, it kind of depends on the employee the specific employee and the type of work and the, um, the type of business the employee's working at as well. But we saw as far as kind of like common claims, I'd say like appearance, like the clothing and grooming were very popular, Sabbath observance, kind of like prayer break type cases were also um, very popular. Um, and by popular, I mean, uh, were charges that were filed at the EOC. Um, and then also just kind of normal discrimination of I wasn't hired because I was ex religion or I wasn't promoted or um, kind of the normal kind of disparate treatment type uh, claims as well. Great. Um, I think along along that same kind of track, um, can an employer force an employee to attend a workshop that might subject the employee to be shamed for their political and religious beliefs? Would that be like the holiday party where it would be pretty easy for the employer to just allow someone not to attend. Yeah, so I think it would depend on the matter of the workshop. If it's, um, if you're, I mean, if you're shaming an employee because of their religious beliefs, um, that seems to border on uh, religious harassment um, from, like on behalf of, uh, from the employer to the employee. Um, and so that seems to be, um, maybe on some extreme illegal. If it's talking about, um, I know there's been a lot of issues related to, I think, trainings um, uh, like in the LGBT context and like what are our non-discrimination policies. If uh, courts have basically said, like if it's just informing employees, these are our policies, there's usually not um, an accommodation to get out of hearing about policies, but if it's requiring um, an affirmative like, oh, I agree with this, or I'm promoting this, or I think this is the best thing ever, then that's something where there's um, room for an accommodation to not participate in, uh, I don't know, like the Pride Month celebration or whatever it is. I think there's, this is also an issue in, I think, the, the uh, race context, critical race theory um, uh, as well, which is beyond the scope. But I think there's a lot of issues as far as employer mandated trainings that go beyond just these are the policies to here's how you need to act or here's how you need to think as well. Great. All right, so our next question, uh, if an employer announces the existence of an exemption to its vaccine mandate, so back on the vaccine kind of track, of any kind, does it waive its right to argue that it could not accommodate a religious exemption? That is to argue that a religious exemption would constitute an undue hardship. I'm not sure if they waive the right, but I think it would be much harder to prove uh, the undue hardship um, is it, there, you could potentially see a circumstance where uh, we can allow, you know, out of 100 people, we can allow 10 people to not be vaccinated before it creates an undue hardship. Um, but if you're number 11, then maybe maybe it uh, creates an, an undue hardship. And so, um, but I think it would be harder for the employer to prove that if they allow other employees 
to um, have accommodations for secular reasons. Uh, and there's nothing super special about allowing just one more. Uh, it would be much harder for them to try to claim an undue hardship. Uh, you see this, I think, in the um, uh, prison context where if you can allow uh, like Colt B. Hobbs, if you can allow a beard for medical reasons, you can also allow, you know, a quarter inch beard for religious reasons as well. And so if you allow something for secular reasons, um, it's much harder for the employer to say you can't also have it for religious reasons without um, bordering on uh, religious discrimination in that point. Great. Now another, another question. Um, from Jeffrey Wood, who is wondering about significant shifts in the EEOC following the departure of Sharon Gustafson. Yes, so uh, so Sharon was my boss, full disclosure, um, and when she got fired, uh, my employment ended as well since my employment was tied to her. Um, unfortunately, um, there, uh, there were efforts to uh, stop the work we were doing for the Religious Discrimination Work Group and uh, we had held listening sessions with religious um, on religious discrimination with a variety of uh, interested uh, stakeholders on from a variety of perspectives. We uh, compiled a report discussing all of that information. Um, it was posted on the website, um, but uh, right before Sharon got fired, it um, the report was taken off. The uh, press release about the report was taken off. Uh, her eight minute podcast talking about the listening sessions in the report was taken off. Um, and so um, I don't know exactly what's happening at the EOC right now as I am no longer there, but uh, it was really unfortunate that uh, that was being silenced um, under the under the new administration. Um, the report is public, it was shared. Uh, if you want a copy, I'm happy to provide you with a copy of that um, as it is a public document. Um, but uh, that happened right before Sharon got fired, whether it's related or not. Um, she was not given a reason for why uh, the president wanted to fire her uh, early from her four year term that was established by statute, uh, which is another issue, um, whether the uh, president has power to to do that or not uh, without cause. But um, all that to say is uh, that happened right before we left and I'm not sure exactly what all is going on at the EOC right now, but um, yeah. Is any of that material available elsewhere? So the, the report that you'd compiled or and as a side note to our audience, if you are interested in a copy of it, I'm sure that so long as you're you're able to share that with me, Rachel, then we can certainly make that available to people. Yeah, I can share it with you. I don't know if it's um, if it's linked anywhere on online. Uh, we had emailed it. It was it was a public report issued by the EOC. It's okay. publicly available on the website, and it was emailed to um, the participants of the listening session. Um, I don't. It's no longer on EOC's website, uh, but I can share that with you. And if anyone's interested, they can reach out and and get a copy of that. Yes, that would be great. Um, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, do you have any other comments that you are interested in sharing? I I do have um do have a question that I'm curious to know your reaction to, or um you're welcome to make some additional comments. Uh, go ahead. What's your, what's your question? Okay. Um, I'm just curious, and you kind of touched on this with the discussion about the um the the drug runners in the Tenth Circuit. Uh, where the court found that their belief is not, their religious belief is not sincerely held, or it was um, pretextual, I think was what you had said. And I'm wondering how courts are, how courts are able to handle looking at religious claims to determine whether, whether a religious belief is sincerely held, whether it's pretextual, because I know that it's certainly been raised to me before, someone could claim to have a sincerely held religious belief that assaulting people is required by their religion and I that that's probably that's a that's an easy one I suppose but um I I, I guess that's that's really the question is where where yeah. does the court look to for that kind of guidance or that kind of question yeah so so whether something uh, a religious belief is sincerely held is almost always assumed um by the courts there it's almost never an issue. Uh, usually something pretextual is like, you know, like statements to the op opposite or uh, kind of like 
a newfound religious belief that just happens to be convenient. Uh, so it's a very fact specific situation, but it's almost always assumed um, by the courts. Um, and until maybe COVID-19 uh, vaccines, uh, it's, I think, generally been assumed by employers. They don't usually question unless there's like some obvious reason of you asked for a secular reason and now you're asking for a religious reason after we denied for the secular reason. Uh, it's almost always assumed um, the religious claim might fail for other reasons, but usually not because it's not sincerely held. Um, so uh, yeah, something obviously, even if you did have a religious belief to uh, assault, assault others, there'd be reasons to stop that apart from whether it was sincerely held. And so often courts will just assume or uh, litigants in a case will just assume sincerity and mm -hmm. then uh, the claims will be defeated on um, on another basis, such as undue hardship, which would be the case in that case. <laughs> Great, thank you. Very interesting. Um, okay, at this point, we are approaching the end of the hour. So, if you have any closing comments that you would like to make, please do feel free. And we're very much looking forward to part two of the series. Um, but I'll turn the floor back over to you for any closing comments. Awesome. Thanks, Evelyn, and thank you everyone for listening. Um, as I mentioned, I'll share the uh, the report we compiled on uh, religious discrimination listening sessions um, with my former boss, Sharon Gustafson, uh, general counsel of EOC. Um, and then also, if you want to know more, uh, the EOC religion guidance, uh, which was updated January 15th of 2021, um, is very helpful on these topics. It provides uh, an overview of what I talked about um, as far as other nuances of employment law uh, as it relates to religious discrimination. Um, if you Google EOC religion guidance, um, it should pop up. It's like section 12 religious discrimination, um, section 12 of their guidance. Um, so that's really helpful. It has cases and it has examples to help you think through these issues. Um, of note, the guidance itself is not legally binding as EOC doesn't have rulemaking authority under Title VII, but it's a great resource. I refer to it um, a bunch uh, while at the EOC and also now that I'm not at the EOC as well. Uh, so I encourage you to look there for more information. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, to our audience for sending in your questions, we welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org and particularly with reference to the to the um, report, if you would like a copy of it, then I'd be happy to send it to you once Rachel has sent it to me. So please do let me know if you would like a copy. And until part two of the series, we are adjourned. Thank you.